On May 10th, 2002, what many believe to be impossible happened. Oswaldo Paya, joined by fellow opposition leaders, submitted the first of 11,020 signatures of the Varela Project at the National Assembly. Thousands of Cubans were challenging the totalitarian power demanding a national referendum from the dictatorship to change the law guaranteeing human rights. They demanded freedom of expression, association, press and economic freedoms, amnesty for political prisoners, and a new electoral law that would ensure free elections, a door open towards democracy. The world shines a light on the fight for freedom in Cuba. The European Parliament recognizes Oswaldo Paya with an award, and he is repeatedly nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He becomes a respected voice within the international community, and he has the support of various presidents in Europe and the Americas. Oswaldo becomes the visible alternative to the Castro regime. The regime reacts with violence and repression. They jailed dozens of Varela Project campaign leaders in what became known as the cause of the 75. It violated its own constitution by forcing the National Assembly to ignore this legal project. At the same time, a forced collection of signatures circulated through the country to illegally amend the constitution and make socialism irrevocable and unchangeable making communism mandatory and eternal. The regime's attacks did not stop Oswaldo and the mobilization for the right to have rights continued. In the following years, 25,000 more signatures were added to the Varela project. In 2011, in response to the Castro's continued efforts to maintain their power, Oswaldo proposed holding a binding plebiscite to change the system and hold free elections. At that time, the decline of the regime was undeniable, but its capacity to repress its citizens remained intact. ¿Teme por su vida en Cuba? Sí, pero mire, temo por mi vida porque me pueden meter un balazo, me puede partir un rayo, me puede pasar uno de los carros eso de la seguridad que me persigue cuando voy en la calle con mi bicicleta. The dictatorship was running out of resources to silence Oswaldo Paya and squash his efforts to mobilize Cubans. The secret police, known as the G2, then upgraded from threats to attacks. On several occasions, Paya discovered that the bolts on his car tires had been loosened after leaving it parked on the street. One time, an oxygen canister inexplicably exploded in his hands at work. Another time, while driving with his wife, a car belonging to the G2 sideswiped them from behind, causing his old Volkswagen to lose control and flip. A crime that could have ended both of their lives. Less than two months later, Oswaldo Paya and Harold Cepero were both assassinated. Harold Cepero was 30 years old and one of the key leaders of the Christian liberation movement. Almost 24 years earlier, Osvaldo Paya had founded the movement to conquer freedom and sovereignty for the people of Cuba. On July 22nd, Osvaldo and Harold were scheduled to visit fellow opposition leaders in the East. They were traveling in a car rented for them by foreign sympathizers because the political police that threatened Paya on a daily basis monitored and controlled the entire public transportation system, and Paya's car was much too old to handle such a long drive. The journey began in Havana. Osvaldo Paya and Harold Cepero sat in the back seat, while the Spaniard Angel Carromero drove and the Swede Johns Aaron Modig occupied the front passenger seat. At 6 a.m., one of the accounts managed by the G2 announced on Twitter that Osvaldo Paya was leaving his house. As usual, they began to follow them. After several hours on the road, one of the cars that was following them accelerated hit Fayal's car from behind and ran it off the road, forcing them to stop. Everything happens lightning fast. G2 agents get out of the other cars and forcibly remove the two foreigners from the car. Harold Cepero hands his work cell phone to Aaron before losing sight of him. The Spanish boy questions them. Who are you? Why do you do this to us? This phrase appears in the minutes read by police captain Medina at the Bayamo hospital that day. The record has since disappeared 
but it also mentions several witnesses that saw Harold touching his chest and asking for help at the scene. The agents take everyone to the hospital except Oswaldo. They wait a long time before taking him. Why? The foreigners and Harold were transferred to the hospital by military men. The nurse who admits the Spanish man asks him, what happened? Angel begins to explain that a car ran into them, but the officer forces him to keep quiet. This testimony exists. The foreigners send out text messages begging for help. The Paya family in Havana call their friends in Bayamo and ask them to run over to the hospital. Some manage to get in before they close the gates. Two police lines prohibit entry into the hospital to any unauthorized persons. From Havana, Oswaldo's daughter is frantically making phone calls. Inexplicably, a forensic doctor answers Oswaldo Paya's cell phone and simply says that one person is deceased. Hours later, the Bayamo Hospital finally informs the family, Osvaldo has died. Friends who remained inside the hospital confirmed the tragic news, though it would not be the last of it. Before the end of the day, Harold also died in the hospital after being left on a stretcher without medical attention for hours. He had been sentenced to death. Oswaldo's wife, now a widow, forbids them from performing an autopsy until she can see her husband's body. The director of the Bayamo Hospital then claims that they're not able to keep the body because all of the morgue refrigerators in the city are broken. The wife has no choice but to consent and wait for the body in Havana. To this day, the authorities refuse to share the autopsy report with the family, despite repeated legal requests. Several countries have also requested access to the results. The regime continues to deny access to it. No one dares to sign it. The funeral was massive. While evidence of the attack was not yet known, the national television programs had already begun to spread lies about the events. But everyone in Cuba knew that Baya had been killed. Hundreds gathered to say goodbye to Baya. The church and the surrounding square were full of people. The Castro sent police officers, the G2 forces, and rapid response brigades. The repressors beat and arrested many of those in attendance as they left for the cemetery. The regime's message to people was clear. Any of you can end up just like Osvaldo Payá and Harold Cepero. The two foreigners who were in the car went missing. They had been isolated initially and later imprisoned after their first night at the hospital. The regime needed a scapegoat and they found one in the Spaniard. That was not a trial, it was a circus. A circus orchestrated by the Ministry of Interior and the G2 who did everything possible so that the circus did not end. For several days before the trial, the city of Bayamo had been militarized. They arrested all oppositioners, independent journalists in the area, and all of those who tried to reach the area. Metal barricades and police lines surrounded the provincial court. No one was allowed in. Only a few journalists hand-selected by the government were able to enter a room to watch the trial on a television. The military barricades prevented Oswaldo's sons and daughter, still dismayed by the crime, from coming within less than 100 meters of the court. Despite the regime's best efforts to hide the facts and publish false accounts through national media, which is then reiterated by the dictatorship's own international propaganda apparatus, the widely accepted evidence confirms the attack. After investigating, the Human Rights Foundation's legal team maintains that in the case of Osvaldo Paya, the evidence and testimonies that were revealed in the months after the attack were not considered at all by the Cuban court that convicted Angel Carromero. These include witness statements, physical evidence, and expert reports that suggest the direct responsibility of the Cuban regime in the death of Paya and Severo. Specifically, the deliberately excluded evidence indicates that the events that occurred on July 22, 2012, were the result of a motor vehicle incident deliberately provoked by state agents. The Castros ordered the murder of Osvaldo Paya, but were unable to kill his legacy. Yo no te odio, pero no te tengo miedo. Tú eres mi hermano, 
pero yo no me voy a someter más a ti. Yo no tengo toda la verdad, vamos a buscar juntos la verdad, pero no me impongas la tuya. Cuba Decide es una iniciativa de movilización ciudadana e internacional para cambiar el sistema hacia la democracia y el Estado de Derecho. Busca someter al régimen a la voluntad soberana del pueblo en las urnas y dar paso al cambio. Ahora tú también conoces la realidad y la propuesta. Tú puedes ser parte del cambio y apoyar el derecho de decidir del pueblo cubano. El cambio está en tus manos. Únete.